high speed news real quick. So we should have started a minute ago. Oh, okay. Good morning. Good Sunday morning. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We are going to worship the King of Kings. We're going to set our hearts before him now. Father God, in Jesus' name, we come before you because through the blood of Jesus we can. Father God, enter our worship anoint our worship through the King of Kings. Hallelujah. Father, Holy Spirit, have your way here this morning. Change whatever you want to change. Holy Spirit, we give you authority this morning. We recognize you for who you are because that's who you are. You're a, the authority over the earth through the body of Christ. And I thank you the body is starting to take their place and have voice, and have voice. We are the voice of God on the earth. Don't ever make that small in your life. Don't ever think less of that in your life. You are the voice of God on the earth, creating souls, cr creating revival for souls to be saved. With your mouth, you got saved. With your mouth, you share salvation. With your mouth, you give life to others. And with our mouths, we, we become an incense in heaven. Worship you, Lord. We become a sweet aroma in God's nostrils in heaven. And there's many, many, many colors around heaven. So your voice... When God speaks, colors form. It's a beautiful, colorful place in heaven. It's not dull. It's not. Uh, 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 it's not so holy that we can't see the beauty of it. He is beauty. He is beauty. And we speak the name of Jesus over this congregation. We speak the name of Jesus over this city. We speak the name of Jesus over our homes. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Hallelujah. We speak Jesus.
Jesus. 
Jesus is the cornerstone. Say, Jesus, you're the cornerstone. Jesus, you're the cornerstone. Yes, you are. You are the cornerstone. Uh -huh. And he's moving all over right now. People are, you know, there's more revivals taken on. There's more people getting saved because you know what? He's the real cornerstone. Amen. Yeah. 
declarations. We see mountains move, yeah. Oh. We're going to sing something on purpose because your declaration, when it marries the fire of a God, things move. And we've had enough, enough with the attacks on the church. Enough is enough. And the body of Christ needs to get an attitude. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. Hallelujah.
daylight and sins rise. Day and night, night and daylight and sins my child I have told you I'm coming I am coming in my glory there were days that you didn't believe you could make it but I was there to lift you up you are my glory on this earth you are the one to go out and shed that glory yes the captives will be set free the drug addict will drop that needle your children will Bow down and serve me. That is my promise to you this day. Oh, what a day it will be when I come and gather you. What a joyous time we will have. I can't wait to take you, but no one knows the time. No one knows the place. Just be ready. When you see that cloud open up and I come on that white horse, I'm taking you with me. You are a warrior. You have been a warrior. I have blessed you to be a warrior. So go out and do your army proud. Praise God. Thank you. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. <clears throat> By the way, as you may or may not have noticed, we have a guest drummer with us today. <laughs> Mr. Neil Britzolero. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, my friend. Well, yeah, we didn't even have to pay him. Praise God. You know? Thank you, Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit wants to move today. Hallelujah. And he is moving more and more and more. We're seeing it more and more. Hallelujah. Okay. Got a couple things going on today. We have communion today. Hallelujah. It's the fourth Sunday of each, each month we have that. So uh, we're having that. Also, uh, next Sunday is uh, Family Fellowship. Just keep that in mind over here in the um, fellowship room. 
And uh, a Sean update, many of you got it. I, I have a string of about 20 people that we send this to. That's all I can send it to. But uh, Sean texted me yesterday and said he was up and walking with help. So praise God. The man had open heart surgery two days ago, or three days ago now. But, uh, and he's up and walking. Pumps in, he's walking. Blood's flowing, hallelujah. Um, my wife and I are going to be over there this afternoon, uh, uh, seeing him briefly. Uh, and I informed him that um, <clears throat> basically what we've uh, believed is that he needs rest, he needs relaxation, he needs sleep, he needs to gain his strength. So uh, no one is, you know, we're not invading the place because we could. Uh, but he, he will take cards. Uh, Paula, you, you indicated you have his address. So Ms. Paula, stand up, please. Yay, let's hear it for Paula. Yeah, hola. Uh, she has the address. And if you can give it to Nida so she can have it out back, that's all. Or out front. Uh, you can send him a card. You can send him money. You could probably not send him food. You could try sending him food. But uh, I know he, he's uh, in great spirits. And uh, as soon as we get done talking with him, I'll send up another up update. And uh, other than that, it's time for communion. Mr. Michael. Mr. Michael and Ms. Pastor Nancy. Morning. This is Communion Sunday. And if the communion servers would like to prepare themselves to come forward, if you would like uh, pre uh, the, the pre-made communion, please raise your hand and you'll get the pre-made communion. Otherwise, you will get the traditional communion. If you are live streaming and you would like to partake of communion as well at home, you could take uh, some bread or a cracker and some juice and join in with us. The one stipulation is that you made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm going to read in verses 24 and 25. In verse 24, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body, which has been broken for you. Whenever you take this and eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. In verse 25, then after supper, he took the cup of the new covenant and said, This is the cup of the new covenant. In my blood, do this in remembrance of me whenever you partake of it. Do this in remembrance of me. What Jesus was saying, or what Paul was writing in regards to Jesus Christ is, Do this in remembrance of me. Oftentimes we think remembering has to do with recalling past events that no longer have a reality 
to it. But in the Jewish sense and in the Jewish liturgy and in their tradition, remembering is a whole different uh, meaning. It has a whole different meaning. In the Jewish sense, when you're asked to remember something, you're asked to become an active participant in the here and now, an active participant in an event that took place in the past, but you're doing it in the here and now. So that active participation is so important. Let me give you an example. Uh, when Noah and the flood came, God gave Noah the, uh, the rainbow as a covenant reminder that he would never judge the earth in that way again. So whenever you see the rainbow, you remember that covenant promise that we will never experience that kind of flood again. That faith that we partake of is an active reminder, a participant of something, that event that happened in the past, but we know it affects our present and our future. The Passover. The Passover is much the same way. The Jewish people became active participants in the here and now whenever they partake of the Passover meal. The Seder meal, every part of the Seder meal that they practice is a reminder and a remembrance of what God did for them when he took them out of Egypt. And in the here and now, the Jewish people celebrate what they have been delivered from and they include their children so that every future generation will continue to bring into remembrance through the active participation of the Seder and Passover meal of remembering what God did. We know that the lamb was slaughtered, the blood was put on the doorposts, and that the lamb was eaten on the night before they were delivered from Egypt. That was a foreshadowing and a symbol of the coming Messiah. Now here at the Passover, or here as Jesus was celebrating the Passover meal, he now introduces himself as the Passover lamb. It'll be his body that will be broken. It'll be his body nailed to the cross. It'll be his blood that is poured out over the doorposts of our heart. When we celebrate communion, we become active participants when we partake of the bread and the juice. How do we become part uh, active participants? Because we come into remembrance of what the Passover lamb did for us. But I want to take it one step further. I want you to picture yourself now at that Passover meal as your Lord is standing there and he looks down at you and he says, send me to the cross. And you look at him and you say, I don't want to send you to the cross. I know the pain. I know what you will go through. I know what you will suffer. I know how you will be crucified. I know how the crown of thorns will be jammed into your head, that you will be whipped beyond recognition. I can't, I can't, I can't send you to the cross. But Jesus looks at you and says, I am willingly going to the cross. When you send me, I will go and lay out my redemption plan. You cannot be redeemed unless I go to the cross. So we send Jesus to the cross. He takes our sin to the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So our Savior takes our sin, and it is at the cross that we are forgiven, washed, purified, cleansed, and delivered. And when we know that our sin sent him to the cross, we also know when we celebrate communion that we are forgiven. We have salvation. We have resurrection power, and we have redemption. And we thank our God for that every time we partake.
The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that Jesus became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And in Matthew, it says that he bore our infirmities. <clears throat> in Isaiah 53.4, it says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Surely means absolutely beyond all argument, beyond all doubt. He has borne our griefs. The Hebrew means our sicknesses or diseases and carried our sorrows. Sorrows in the Hebrew means physical pains. So this is for physical healing. And we know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when it says that by his stripes we were healed, by his stripes we are healed, by his stripes we will be healed, we participate in that healing because Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And the works of the devil is sickness, disease, pain, suffering, anxieties, mental torments, demonic oppression, all of these things. So Jesus came to destroy those works. And by his stripes, we were healed. We are healed. We will be healed. We participate in that. And we remember that it occurred one time for all, but in our hearts, it should still be occurring every day. We are set free daily. So let's partake of our elements, Father. When Jesus took the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take this and eat it, all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you. And after the, after the supper, he took the cup, gave it to his disciples and, and told them, take this and drink it, all of you. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all men so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. We need that remembrance daily. We need that remembrance daily rather than looking at what's around us and what, what we feel like. We need to remember that he is the author and the finisher. He is our healing and he is our salvation. In Jesus' name, let's partake. As we receive the offering, we were singing a song, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy, did I got it there right, Paul? Worthy is the, you know, and um, when we were singing that, I couldn't help the book, thinking about it. In the book of Revelation, it says this, they're, they're around the throne. This is after they get raptured, chapter five. And it says, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, and strength and honor and glory and blessing in every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him who has sits on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him, worship who lives forever and ever. And we were singing that song, and I'm, that's the first thing that can be, worthy is the Lamb. But you know that in the fifth chapter, when they get raptured, 
chapter 4, the beginning of chapter 4 says, come up here. There's the rapture. And I will show you things that must take place. So now they're up in chapter 5 and they're worshiping the Lord around the throne. And I believe there's 16 times the word throne. Don't quote me on that. But it's, it's a time of worship and praise. And so when we were singing that song, Worthy is the Lord, I, all I could see was worthy is the Lamb. That we're gonna, and the four and twenty elders, okay, is the church of Jesus Christ. And I don't want to get into the book of Revelation, but um, so that's, that's awesome. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lord. Worthy, we're going to be around the throne. Worthy when he says, come up hither and I will show you great things to come. I mean, I can only picture what heaven's going to be like. But right now when we sang that song, we're the prelude to going up. We're here on earth worshiping him, waiting for him to say, come up and I will show you great things to come. Amen. Father, we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be around the throne with four and twenty elders worshiping you, worthy is the Lamb, in honor and praise and glory forever and ever. So we honor you, Lord, as we give the tithe to you, praising you and glorifying you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Hear me. Everyone? I don't sound mumbly or anything like that? That's good. Just got to fire up my laptop. Oh. I don't know about you, but I just absolutely loved praise and worship this morning. Um, Paula mentioned that as soon as we started practicing, um, yeah, actually, I don't need it unless my computer conks out. So if it conks out, I'll give you the head. Yeah, I'll autograph it later. Uh, as soon as we started practicing, and practicing wasn't the, we used to go through the set, you know, uh, just to warm up. Uh, it wasn't pretty. The, the keyboard player just really had a problem at times. Hallelujah. But uh, the presence of God was here and still is here. And praise God, he continually follows us because he is in us. So, today... This is going to be a slightly different. Um, again, as, as everyone who does teach here, um, you know, we come before the Lord and just pray. Lord, what, what do you want said? What do you want delivered to your people? And there's a couple things floating around in my heart, and this just really just came to the surface. Um, The title is Knowing God. Sounds very simple, doesn't it? Knowing God. But if you start drilling down in it a little bit, there's a lot of questions that 
come up. Um, brings a, a lot of thoughts involved. Um, what does it mean to know God? Can we even begin to know God? Can we even begin to know God? How do we get to know God? Is it even scriptural to know God? Does God even want us to know him? Is everyone hearing that buzz? Okay. Rich, let me know when you want me to go to the handheld. Okay. Um, there's a myriad of questions that come up, but what the Holy Spirit wants us to discuss today is knowing God. And, okay, Rich, uh, if, you want me to go to the handheld? Yeah. Was that a yes or a no? Yeah. Okay. Don't you love technology? I really do. Praise God. Yes. Louder? Is this okay? Thank you. If you can't hear me, just throw something. I'll try to catch it up. So, knowing God. A lot of questions. Let's start with the first question. Does God even want us to know him? Thank you. Ms. Joni gets the prize. Unequivocally, resounding, yes. God wants us to know him. Uh, John uh, 17, 3 says it very clearly. Um, this is from HCSB, uh, a new translation that, uh, not a new translation, but new to me. Uh, but it's, it's pretty good. John 17, 3 says, This is eternal life, that they may know you. This is Jesus' prayer before he leaves the planet. This is his prayer to his Father. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. We just participated in communion. Churches have communion across this nation. But do we really know what he wants in terms of communion? And we will get to that. I believe that communion with his children is one of the deepest desires of God's heart. Some see, it as, some see God as this supreme being that barely puts up with, with mankind, with humankind. And God is, is so far away from us most of the time. He doesn't really want to come near us at all. Uh, a God, he's a God that usually doesn't want anything to do with us. And a God that is quick to discipline when we step out of line. That's what some people, that's how some people see our Father. And I really feel sorry for people like that. They're into legalism. And legalism kills. It really does at least spiritually. Let's look at John 17, 3 again. Jesus told us, this is eternal life, that, you, that they may know you. God doesn't look at us like some sort of parasite that he puts up with. God loves us with a, a love so deep, I doubt we could even come close to understanding it. He's a God that always, that always, that always and forever will love us. And a God that made himself flesh, came among us, taught us, and gave his life for our salvation. However, I need to make something clear. And the Holy Spirit has shown me a lot in, in putting this together. I used a number of resources. One is this. Our salvation isn't a possession. We don't possess our salvation. It's not something we just have. Our salvation is a relationship. It's a relationship that God has made with us. And an eternal life is not simply living forever. It is growing in the knowledge and love of God. Which brings us to the word know. K-N-O-W, know. What does it mean when we say to know God? As many of us realize, and I say this all the time because we stream live and someone might not know it, many of us realize that all the English versions of the Bible are translations of different languages. The Old Testament was originally written primarily in Hebrew with some Aramaic. The New Testament was written originally in Greek. And all the English versions of the Bible are translations of these languages. 
In the New Testament, there's a number of Greek words that translate into the English as know, knowing new. However, the Greek word translated as no in John 17, 3 is a very special word. The Greek word translated no is genosko. Uh, the English transliteration is G-I-N-O-S-K-O, genosko. Very important. Genosko doesn't refer to the simple casual knowing of an acquaintance, like I know Pastor Frank, yeah. I know Sammy, I, I know Michelle, uh, I know a lot of you. Doesn't, that's not Ganasco. It, nor does it refer to knowing a fact like, hey, I know the United States is composed of 50 states. That's not Ganasco. Ganasco means knowing by being part of an intimate, growing relationship. It is not some fact we memorize, but the kind of knowing that is gained through experience and through intimacy, through relationship. I can say I ganasco my wife. We've been married 26 years. Going on 27? Hey, I got that, praise God. Yes. In 27 years, we have had relationship. We have had communion together. And each day we ganasco each other more and more. And that is, was the prayer of Jesus that we ganasco God. We know him through an intimate relation. And this is the type of relationship God wants us to have with the Godhead, with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He wants us to have a deep, intimate love relationship with him, which grows sweeter throughout time and eternity. So, how do we approach this? How do we become closer and closer to God? How do we get to know God intimately? One answer to that question is found in one word, prayer. And that's where we're going today, prayer. And I'm going to be redefining in your mind prayer. This might sound kind of strange to some people, but I'm, I'm going to expound on it. I'm going to flesh it out. To some people, prayer is nothing more than going to God and asking for things. And yeah, that, that is part of prayer. But it is not a complete definition of prayer. Another definition of prayer is petition, supplication, praise, and thanksgiving. And that's scriptural. But again, even though this is included in the definition of prayer, it is not the whole thing. I believe prayer... The type of prayer that God wants is not just praying to God, but also being with God, fellowshipping with him. And I've come to know that personally more and more in the last couple months. Communing with God, talking to and talking with God. And you know what? That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to be able to hear him, hear his voice hear his heart. I believe that until we move beyond our limited perceptions of prayer, such as petition, supplication, praise, and thanksgiving, we will never come to the deep, loving relationship for which we were created. And a deep, loving relationship wants us to have with him the deep, loving relationship that God wants us to have with him. Don't misunderstand me, please. Those aspects of prayer, petition, supplication, praise, and thanksgiving are important. But if they do not flow out of Ganasco, not flow out of knowing God intimately, they are in danger of becoming mere religious activities. Let me ask you this. Do we realize that God longs for us? Do we realize how deeply God loves us? more than we can ever imagine. And God shows us in his word, the Bible, over and over. For instance, when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, one of the things the Bible reveals to us is that we become engaged to him. That's why in the body of Christ, we were referred to as the bride of Christ. Uh, let's go to Ephesians 5, uh, verses 25 through 32. And I'm going to read it first from uh, New King James. Very familiar scripture. Paul's talking about husbands and wives for a while, but then he flips at the end. 
from uh, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Good thing to know. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave the fa his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. If you look at the Amplified Version of Ephesians 5.32, it says, This mystery of two becoming one is great, but I am speaking with reference to the relationship of Christ and the church. We're his bride. Thank you, Lord. I'm just, when you have, when I have silence like this, I, I'm not talking with you guys, I'm talking with the Holy Spirit. And I'm just, there's something we might go off a, a little bit. Um, what kind of marriage do you think Rosemary and I would have if I just saw her about an hour and a half, maybe even two hours on a Sunday? That's it. Be a great marriage, wouldn't it? Yes. We'd know each other. We'd know each other's likes, dislikes. We'd know each other's heart. We would know who we are, who, who she, you know, who she is, who I am. We'd really come together in that two hours. Uh, if you believe that, Pastor Nancy has a uh, marriage class that she gives periodically. I'd suggest you sign up. The time that we have on earth from the time we get saved until we go back to be with the Lord, I believe in the rapture, is our betrothal period. We are betrothed to Jesus. It's our opportunity to spend lots of time with God. And when I say God, I'm talking about the Godhead, you know, and I know that Father is in heaven right now, Jesus is in heaven right now, Holy Spirit's within us, but Someday we'll learn how they communicate with each other because it says one is, is the other and the other is the other, and I can't understand it real well, but it's the Godhead, and they're all united together, blessing us. The time that we have on earth with Christ is an opportunity to spend lots of time with God, depending on our relationship, deepening, pardon me, our relationship, and sharing our hopes and dreams our joys and our pains, our successes and our challenges. Paul told the, Paul told the Corinthian church this, 2 Corinthians 11, 2 from New King James. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. During our betrothal, our fiancé, Jesus, longs for our company. He wants us to share whatever is on our hearts and be comfortable enough sometimes even to be able to simply sit together silently. How many times have you been in prayer? And I've been praying in the spirit and it's just, just quiet. Be still and know that I am God. And, okay, Lord, those simple little words are so, so, so deep. Be simple, simple little words. Be still and know that I am God. That is so deep. We'll study that for probably eternity. Just that, plus a bunch of other stuff. Sometimes we can just sit together silently and Holy Spirit ministers to me. Okay. The other day I was driving, and actually I can tell you the intersection I was at. 
I was thinking about my life, and I was thinking about how in heaven's name did I get in the position that I'm in right now? You know, I worked for OSHA for almost 40 years. I retired thinking Rosemary and I are going to go to Florida, going to go to Virginia, going to, yeah. And Holy Spirit had another plan. So I became, you know, pastors asked me to come on staff. I did as an associate, was ordained. And then, as we know, uh, we transitioned from uh, Pastor Dom and then, or Pastor Dom and Lucy to Pastor Dom, and then transitioned from Pastor Lucy to myself. Thank you, Pastor Lucy. Praise God. Yeah, amen. Give her a hand. For all the years you've given your life to the Lord. Praise God. Anyway, amen. Anyway, since I've become senior pastor, I can't believe the doors that have opened to people of esteem that like me, that actually asked me to go out to lunch. People that I, I pictured on these pedestals that said, hi, Mike, how you doing? I'm going, why am I in this position? I'm, I'm in so many centers of spiritual power, spiritual uh, depth, spiritual uh, anointing. And I'm going, Lord, how did I ever get here? Why, why am I, it, just little old Mike, why am I here? Why am I in these positions? Then I shut my mouth, put the, my foot on the brake, stop sign, and the Holy Spirit responded back to me. It was so strong, it was almost audible. He said, because I love you. Simple little thing, because I love you. That's our Heavenly Father, because he loves us. He wants the best for us. And part of that is knowing him, knowing he wants the best for us, knowing that he loves us. But it goes so far beyond that, knowing what he wants us to do in every situation and circumstance and spending time with him. So back to our betray betrothal. He wants us to hear his voice in everything he says to us. We are, his, we are precious to him. We are a treasure he holds dear to his heart. And he wants us to share our life with him. This is the God that some other religions have painted, or some other denominations have painted this entity someplace way out there that really can't stand us and you're just lucky to be breathing because he'll probably snuff you out someday. No, no. Our Heavenly Father, our Savior, our wisdom, our knowledge, wants us to be so part of our lives. When Jesus looked upon Jerusalem, the city he loved so much, he was hurt by the people's rejections, but he still loved them without measure. He cried out, and it's uh, recorded in Luke 13, 34, from New King James. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. How many Christians can we say that about? Me first at times in the past, but I was not willing. He's there all of the time. He's in us all of the time. Jesus still longs to draw us closely to himself today, to give us security and identity, to let us feel his heart beating with love for us, and to hear every word he says to us, even his whispers, even his heartbeat. He's got so much for each one of us, and you've heard me share many times when uh, the number of times I can't, even I can't even remember, when I was working for OSHA, how I'd be stumped 
I would be at my, my natural mind's end of a problem, a situation, uh, a circumstance, uh, something happened, and I have no idea why. And it's my job to know why or to find out why. Absolutely stumped. And I'd say, Lord, what? What happened? And he would show me. And then I would say it. And then they would think I was brilliant. And it's like, wow, you know? I did tell a few of them, hey, it isn't me. It's, it's the Holy Spirit. He showed me. But he wants that involvement and so much more. He wants to hold us when we weep. He wants to rejoice with us when we rejoice. He wants to direct us to the perfect path for us. He wants us to know his heart. Sometimes I believe we should spend time with the Lord simply in a conversation as with a close friend. It's Lord, what's going on here? At times I believe Jesus says this to us, and I recorded some things. Come to me and talk, listen, enjoy all the things you would do with any earthly friend, although I can be more. I am your everything. Allow me to flow through you, from you, in everything you think, say, and do. Talk more, listen more, watch more. It is easy if you look to me for guidance, for my leading. I love you. Come, rest in my rest. Allow me to flow. That's his heart. That's his heart for every one of us. And I believe Jesus is delighted when we choose Ganasco to know him in an intimate relationship. Semi-sidebar, if you're really interested in how, what God thinks about you, immerse yourself in one of the books of the Bible entitled Song of Solomon, also known as Song of Songs. It's right between Ecclesiastes and Isaiah. On the surface of that book, uh, it describes how two lovers feel about each other However, most biblical scholars and myself also see this as how God feels about Israel and applying it to the New Covenant, which also most scholars do, it also shows a beautiful representation of the love between Christ and his bride, the church. God loves us with an unfathomable love. He longs to express that love to us. The Lord doesn't want us to come to him only when we have a need or a question. He doesn't want us to always have a specific goal in mind when we seek him. He wants us to come to him because we love him so much we can't stay away. I'll say that again. He wants us to come to him because we love him so much we can't stay away. Husbands and wives, when you were dating your spouse, what did you do? You were together all the time, or most of the time. Hopefully it wasn't, well, I'll see you Sunday at 10 o'clock, but by 12, I gotta be out of here. Of course not. Do not think that every time you go to God, it must be to accomplish something. Sometimes simply being together with the Lord is the greatest accomplishment, just being with one another. At times, he just wants us to enjoy each other. I remember the times when Rosemary and I would be someplace, and it'd be so beautiful. And it's just, thank you, Lord. Thank you for bringing us here. And it's like he says, I love you. When the Lord called the 12 disciples, his first and primary reason was that they might be with him. I just finished a book, uh, Walking in the Dust of Rabbi Jesus. And it gives an incredibly deep um, look at what actually went on during the time of Jesus. And uh, Jesus was a rabbi, of course, and what, his, what a rabbi's disciples would be and do. They weren't just 
yeah, I'll see you Sunday, or I'll see you Saturday and Sunday, or wow, I'll see you Wednesday, Saturday and Sunday. They were with him 24-7. And this was not only Jesus as a rabbi, but every rabbi that was a rabbi during that time. They had their disciples. Their disciples lived with them 24-7 because those disciples needed and wanted to know everything about the rabbi what he thought, how he did, how he ate, how he slept, what he talked about, what he thought about, his mannerisms, his uh, re reactions, everything they wanted and needed to know. And that was like Jesus' disciples. His first and primary reason was that they might be with him. He did not really want their service at the beginning, although later that would come. But first and foremost, he wanted them to be with him, to be his friend, to share with him their joys and sorrows, to learn from him. And that's what he wants for us. Rabbi Jesus wants us to be a disciple. And that's not a eight hour a day, five day a week thing. He wants us to be with him continually, to be his friend, to be his lover. We're betrothed to him. To learn from him. To share our joys and sorrows with him. God is always right in our very presence, ready to listen and respond. He is not only with us, obviously, he is in us. I love 1 Corinthians 3.16. It says... Don't you yourselves know that you are God's sanctuary and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Common scripture, but munch on it a while because, again, that can get deep real quick. <clears throat> and in his word, he tells us that he is a great and loving God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. By the way, that Greek word kindness is hasid or kasid. Uh, it is a word that, again, very deep. I, I encourage you to look it up uh, and uh, follow it because it'll tell you a lot. It has to do a lot with covenant. Okay, living in a communion relationship with the Lord is not something we do at special times each week like we did today, although we did it today. God wants us to have communion with him continually. The depth of this is shown in the definition of communion. This is out of Webster's. Definition is the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. I'll say it again. The sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. Communion is a way of life that affects every part of our being. And when we live in communion, in a communion relationship with Jesus, everything we do will be touched. Worship will take on a whole new meaning. When we begin, begin to see it as part of our total experience of communion with the one we love. So, what's the end, end thing of this whole discussion? How many realize that our lives are full of decisions? Every day we have myriads of decisions we have to make, some very inconsequential, some very important, and everything in between. Everything we do and say involves a choice, a decision. God wants to make those decisions with us. By way of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, is he's called also, that lives in us if we're born again. God wants us to turn to him before we make choices, before we say things, before we act. And boy, I need to learn that because sometimes mouth works before brain works. Trust me, that's not a good thing. I got to learn brain works first, then mouth might work may or may not be appropriate. God wants us 
to turn to him before we make choices, before we say things, before we act. And when we have a strong communion relationship with God, doing what he desires is as nat natural as breathing. He wants us to have spiritual awareness, an awareness that he lives inside us, that he is wise and loving and wants to guide us, to love us, to fellowship with us, to be our God and to be our friend, to be our betrothed, and so much more. So I encourage you, take some time. Um, what I do now is just quiet myself at times, try to get everything out of my mind. I do that sometimes by music. Sometimes I just pray in the spirit for a little bit. It works wonderful. And I just say, Lord, what, what would you like to talk about? And it's amazing what comes into your heart. Some things are from me. Some things might be from the world. But a lot of things are from God. Write them down. I become an avid journalist these days. Write them down. And if you question them, just test them. How? By the word. Not sure? Go to someone that you trust, that you know is spiritually mature, and have them pray about it as well. But I know for a fact, time is short. I think most Christians that are in the know know that. Time is short. There's a lot that needs to be done. And he needs his army understanding him. He needs his army to hear his voice. He needs his army to align their hearts with him. And he needs his army to commune with him. Not only receiving orders, but receiving the heart, the love, and everything else brought into it. So I encourage you, just open up your heart and just say, Lord, whatever you want. And I'm positive you will be amazed. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you. I praise you. I bless your holy name. We bless your holy name, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for so much, so much, so much, Lord, that you do for us, that we don't even realize so much that you love, so much that you give, so much that you help. We praise you for it. And help us, Lord, just to more and more and more and more just to commune with you, just spend intimate time with you, telling you how much we love you and how much you love us. I thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen.